So each one of these is a little movie that the idea is that you look through that actually before you start doing the homework, which is right here. So um, you can watch one of these. It's actually, they're very good. Um, see, I was looking at, um, this shows you how to put it into the, um, whatever. So, so if you get stuck, this is really nice because StatCrunch is a software program to do your, your calculating. So I'll show you. Okay, here's a homework, for example. Let's say question number three. So you see how it comes up. Now we're talking about frequency. The year's uh, award was one, so 25 to 34. So they've already done the classes for you. You can see it's 24, 25 to 34, 35 to 44. And these are the numbers that fell into there. You can see it's skewed to the left. They're 28. And then uh, what it's asking you to do here is to defi define the class limit. Um, that would be each class width. And then the boundaries, if you want to put a little boundary in between. And then also, we actually start looking at the data and, uh, and, and putting where it goes. So if you, but here it has this nice option. So when you go, you uh, open automatically to the software program that you need instead of a calculator. And it loads the data for you. So, um, you know, you can do a, a graph. Let's say, so if I go to a histogram, for example, I got frequency. Let's see if that does it. All right, good. So I'm walking up, great. Okay, and then, <laughs> okay, and then there's our histogram. All right, now, this is not a histogram, but a frequency gram. There's a little bit of difference, not much. The picture's the same. So you decide which cells, how many cells you want to put it in. So you're going to take your lowest observation and your highest, and you're going to subtract them. Right? That's the distance, if you will, between the smallest and the largest. And then you're going to divide by how many cells you want. When you do that, that'll give you the class width of each one of these. And then you go through this. Notice that you don't have the actual data. It's already been compiled as a frequency. So if you think, if I know that 35, from 35 to 44, there were 35 people fell into that. But I don't know whether, th you know, this was actually 41, 40, 39. It just gives it all grouped up. You know what I mean? So how would it normally be? Normally you'd get a, a whole table full of data and you just tick off which one of these it goes into. That's all a tally. Then you make these boxes, you make this vertical, see it says frequency. The frequency is simply how many fell in. For example, this first one should have been like 28, so it's probably just below 3 for 30, I suppose, you see. Let's see how that work goes. That's 28, and then 35 to 40. Hmm. 20, that's 25 to 34, way over here. Hmm. I got frequency here, so this should have been, I don't understand what it graphed, but anyway, that's, that's the frequency and that's the age. And then, uh, <coughs> I see you can start wherever you want. Anyway, let me go back to the homework. So now, if you're doing the homework and you have questions, you can go here. And one thing it can do is open the book to the page you need to read. Or view an example or help me sell, solve this actual problem. So, um, and then, of course, you can email it off to me, ask your instructor. And here's StatCrunch. That's the program that I use instead of the calculator. And then, uh, but, but you can see if you view an example, you can see that it, now it's going to walk you through it. You know, it's telling you what to do. It says uh, the smallest number that can find is 30 out of the data. Anyway, I think it's super convenient because you just keep going at it until you get the problem right. And then go on to the next. Okay, so let's supposing that you'd like to see the book. So we're going to question help, and now we want to open our ebook. So now this book should be opening up to something to do with um, frequency. 
uh, graphs or histograms. So this is opening the book to page 42. The book itself has and videos embedded in it, too, if you need further help. So, okay, so frequency. Chapter 1 was basically sh telling you how the subset is going to help infer on the big set, yes? The big set being the population. The small set being the sample. Is that right? So one thing that we want to do is look at frequency. So let's see. Okay. So let's take a look at this now. Okay. So we got the chapter two. This is all about taking the data and putting it in table form. That's all chapter two is. So um, these are called the frequencies. That's just a tally of how many people fell in from a, from a sample. From our sample, how many of them fell into 75 to 124, 125? You understand? Now... Here's uh, some definition for you. It says here, um, I'm not sure if you can see that. Is the print big enough? Can you see it? I guess you can't. Okay. So, um, frequency distribution and frequency table. So, that's what we'll do. Now, the next one after the frequency is called the histogram. And the histogram is really our sample distribution of what we, what we expect the population to be distributed that way. Okay, so let's see if I can write over here. Uh, let me clear that out. Okay. Uh, so you have a bunch of data. Notice that I, you don't have the data in the hand. It's already gave it compiled. So you don't know what the rough data is. Do you see that? So I don't know if you have your cheat sheets available to you on the upper, uh, the very first sheet. I don't know if you can see it. Let's take a look. It's uh, the second equation. It's called the mean frequency table. Do you see that? So um, up to now, this is number two. Now we went over number one. Uh, and then we went over number three, and now it's over number two, okay? And then if you look at equation number three, where it says standard uh, deviation or, you know, now we've got the deviation, and those two last two equations are uh, a shortcut of how to calculate deviation. And equation number three and uh, five, or did you see the little F in there? Does anybody see the F? No? It's like real little. It's a cursive looking F. Anybody need one or even got it? It's, it's, a, it's a second one down. You'll see a little F in it, a second equation. You see it? Or you need one? Huh? Oh. Well, this is part of one. Do people see the little f on this? Is it going to be the second and the fifth equation? Okay. So um, let's take a look at that. All right. So um, let's see if I can go over here. Okay. So let's start over again. So what we have here is we have a sample average, right? which is equal to just all this means is add up all your observations starting from the counter i equals one to little n right because we're in our sample divided by little n that's just an average and all that means is just add them all up all of your observations okay and then we had this one we have sample deviation right which is a summation of every observation subtract the sample mean squared divided by n minus 1 square root. So this is going to be our sample uh, deviation. And this is going to be our sample. Sample what? You got to know what x bar is. <laughs> yep. Sample average. Now that it has to be known by now. Okay, now this is the raw data, but if they give it to you in a frequency format, 
Then we have something that's this, where we have another way of calculating the average, but from the frequency, not from the raw data. So it's a, like a sort of a shortcut. Suppose you don't have the raw data, but you have the frequency graph. You can calculate an estimated mean, sample mean. By the way, mean means average. A lot of this is just terminology. This is sample average, or another word is called mean. Okay, that's, that's just that way that is. Now, X bar, if you do it like this, then you go to the summation of, and then they have a little F. Okay, now the F will be, have the index of I. I go in, and then this little X guy here is going to be, I'm going to put a little M here. Because it means the midpoint of every cell category. You got it? So that's um, then number two on the equation. If you look at the um, uh, upper left-hand corner, it says uh, where it has a frequency. Okay, so the frequency, and then they have it, this one divided by, uh, do they have the number of, what, what do they write in the book? Do they have a number of, I mean, in the, I don't have it. Let's see here. Let me see. Do you have that cheat sheet? Oh, yeah. Let me just look at the top second one. Okay. So they have this one is going to be the sum of the frequencies. So if I take this guy and just take this f of i divided by n. Uh, no, just it. Sorry. Clear. Uh, I want this guy. Okay. Now. These are all my frequencies. So I'm stepping through. Um, and this would be the number of, you know, like I, I goes from I, I again goes from I equals one. And this is F of I. So all I'm saying is that you can calculate the average without having the actual raw data. So let me show you how that would work. So if we have a cell here and a cell here and a cell here and a cell here. Okay, so now we have so many observations that fell in here and so many observations that fell here and so many of them fell here and so on okay so this would be when this would be a group of two three a frequency of five three and one okay now when you step through this you have to take the midpoints of every cell that you have so if that's from zero to ten that midpoint would be 5. That represents your new XM. So when you expand it, what you're going to have is like for the first cell will be 2 times, well, this is between times, you know, the midpoint is 5. Do you see it? Plus, this one is 3. You see it? Times, well, this would have a midpoint of, say, 10 to 20. So it would have a midpoint of, say, 15, and then, and so on, until you get to the final cell. The final cell is going to be frequency. That frequency on the final cell is 1. I mean, um, yeah, it's 1 times, um, in that case, the midpoint, whatever that would be. <laughs> you understand? Times the midpoint, x, the final midpoint, x of m all divided by, uh, can somebody tell me what this adds up to be, if you add them all up? It's basically counting the tallies. Does anybody recognize the total, what is the total frequency equal to? Well, do you know what this N stands for, little n? What is it? You should know it. You shouldn't have to look this up. I mean, little n, my God. Huh? It's your sample size, right? It turns out if you add up all of your frequency, yes, guess what that's going to be equal to? N. Because it's added all of your tallies. It's just counting how many tallies, right? Which is, in fact, your sample size. You got it? Obviously, if we're going through every individual and counting them, if you sum up all the tallies, that should be the sample size. Well, in this case, yeah, but I'm just, this is, you know, just to give you an idea, yeah. Okay? And you can do the same thing for deviation. 
the deviation you'll find it um, also has a frequency. Okay, I just do that to show you that you can solve this without the actual raw data. And these are estimates of this too, so it's not, they're not dead accurate. Uh, you know, this is the most accurate. Now, um, we know that what we do is, okay, this is one X bar, this is a sample deviation, and then we have this distribution of, da of data, okay? So I know that through my count, I'm going to have a call count of the sample size. And um, so these are uh, equally, equally distance, you know. And so when you, when you put your count to it, if you just have a frequency like, you know, two, and then three, and then five, let's say, and four, three, and two, let's say, for example. Now, you want to represent it with the vertical scale. When you represent the vertical scale, which the computer will do it for you or your calculator if you figure it out, you know, you should, you should now make boxes accordingly. This is going to be a height of two. This will be a height of three. You get it? And this would be a height of five, right? So that would be like registered to a five here. You see it? Now, if I take each one of these and I divide by n, so I'm going to have here, 2 divided by little n, 3 divided by what little, little n is in this case, we know if you want to add it. So this is 5 to the n. n is the total sample size. This is 4 over n, 3 over n, and 2 over n. Now, if you notice, you haven't changed the shape of the graph at all. Okay, I mean, you haven't changed. All you're doing is changing the scale of the vertical axis. So you're going to have another axis right and that's going to be whatever 2 divided by n is and you can see it's going to be a number less than 1 right because every number is divided by the total number is that right so we can look at that and now this becomes a probability so if I can ask what is the probability if I turn the light off and pick one of you that you're one of those two that fell in this first category well, it's simply going to be 2 divided by n. That is your probability. If I ask what happens if you fall from here down, the probability of being less than this, then you have to add these two probabilities. And that would answer the question, what is the probability of me selecting somebody that's going to be from, from 3n from here down? Well, now I got you know, 3n plus 2n. Correct? Anybody? Does it, does it make any sense, or is it just me? I just make sense. So you have two scales. This one here, we call it a frequency graph. That's this guy, you know, where you're counting, just tallying. But when you divide by n, now we have a sample distribution. We call it a sample distribution, or for some reason, they like to call it a histogram. Got it? So, but I want you to know that histogram means sample distribution. All right, now why, why is it that I want to know that? Because if I take this, it's like I'm erasing, huh? Okay, now, if I take a look at that, and I said, um, so I, I actually I'm going to call this whole side over here the sample size, the sample space. That contains all our observations that we pulled off of the population. Now, it doesn't look it, but the population is a lot bigger than the sample space in terms of count. So this has a capital N for population. I'm just going to put pop population size okay and of course this one has a capital a uh, little n so that's the sample size okay and this is going to be our best estimator in our inferential statistics to go after mu and mu if you could access all of the data points would be the summation of i equals 1 to little n which is the last observation 
and then we add up all our observations, but we don't go to little n, we actually go to capital N, see, which we'll never do, and then we're going to divide by capital N. So we'll never have it, so we're going to use this as the best estimator of that. All right, and we're going to use the, the, the sample deviation. Not, not, this is the frequency graph. This is the deviation. You know, to be the best estimator of this guy, which is what? What are we trying to estimate with our sample deviation? Huh? Well, we got sample size is little n, and we got big n. I want to know what the sample distribution is going to use to estimate. What do we use it to estimate? Do you understand why this was used as sample mean mu? What is this used to estimate? S is used to estimate. Mm -hmm. Of what? No, this is sample deviation. I don't want to estimate it with itself. What am I using this whole idea of inference? Huh? Population what? Deviation. And how do we express it? What's the symbol? Nope, S is a sample deviation, lowercase sigma. And you know, I mean, I, you have to be able to get this. If you can't know these, t this little thing here, you don't know the course. If you don't know that this is going to be estimating this, you can't pass. It's impossible because this is the whole course. So if it, these are two things that if you can't remember, <laughs> you don't have to look and look it up. You should know that those are used to estimate these. And because right now, there are three things I've asked. These three things are going to estimate these three things, and that's all I've been asking. So this one's going to be equal to what? The summation of I equals 1 to capital N. Notice how s similar it is, because now I'm going to take up all of my observations, and I'm going to subtract what from it? Notice that over here, what did I subtract? No, it's not mu. I'm going to, I'm going to subtract mu, not x bar, because I'm in my population. And if I knew what it was, then I could use it there, and I could find this if I knew what it was. So this is, in theory, divided by capital N minus 1, square root. D you got to see a similarity there. It's the same thing, except we're doing it on the subset. Okay, now this is very important, too. Now this whole shape, this whole shape is called a histogram or what we call a sample distribution. Okay? And guess what it's going to be used to estimate over here? And what is actual called? What side are we on? <laughs> Population. Yeah, very good. So what would it be? If that's called a sample distribution, it shouldn't be that big of a leap mentally to figure out what this would be. That's called a sample distribution. What would it be called over here? Population what? Yes. This is our population distribution. Okay. Oh, um, now, this is telling us how we feel that the, remember, we're looking for patterns in the structure of the data. This is how our best guess of how this, the, the God side, the population is laid out. It really is a kind of a histogram, right? Why is it more smooth? Because there's a lot more data points in the population than over in a sample, usually. Okay, this is it. This got to understand it. I mean, I've done it uh, a couple times, but now uh, I want you to just learn the names so that we can talk the same lingo. Now, if I collect these guys over here, what do I have? I have a little N. On this side, I have a little average, sample average, I have a sample deviation, and I have me what we call uh, sample distribution, okay? All of these, I want you to call these sample, I, I hope you see the word sample being repeated a lot on the sample side, sample statistics. They're used to be, make an inferential estimate of now what are the ones over here the ones over here is what I got written it's mu well it's capital N yes and then it's mu then it's sigma 
and then it's a true distribution. Okay, these guys are going to be called as a set. They're going to be called your parameters. Yeah, because a sample statistic is descriptive. Part of it's just getting the words, the, the, the vocabulary down. Now, um, hopefully it's all recorded. So now I'm going to add another sample statistics that you haven't seen before. And we're going to call it P hat. And over here, there's going to be like this true P. Okay. And guess what? This is going to use to what? Estimate this. Now, p hat is a proportion. OK, a proportion is very natural. For example, if I want to find out not the, if I'm not interested in God's true average, OK, if I'm not too, you know, and I should be, and I should be about the distribution. But this is kind of a forward looking, it's called a row, but let's call it little p. Okay, so p hat is the estimator, a lot like x bar is to mu. p hat is a proportion. So let's ask any question like this. Um, when you say something like 3 out of 10, uh, 3 out of 10 people will have, you know, whatever, cancer by the time they're 90 or whatever. I'm just making a thing. My point is, is that's a ratio, a proportion, an A over B. Proportion is exactly a fraction. And... Uh, so it'd be like any kind of miles per hour, for example. That's, an, that's a rate. Um, so any, uh, you see it's a lot, a lot of natural hypothesis questions when you're asking, well, 3 out of 10, 20 out of 100, whatever. You know, that's your hypothesis. And there is a true proportion only known to God, depending on the question that you're asking. So this would be a proportion like A over B, you know, A over B. Okay, that's a proportion. And whatever you think of is going to be on, you're going to get this proportion based off of your sample. And we're going to make estimates of what we're going to call population. What we're calling it? Population. So proportion. This is R. Population. Proportion. Any questions so far? You got to get this. You got to get committed to memory because this is the course. In chapter nine, when we're doing actual hypothesis testing, we'll be using these guys, which are sample statistics, to put boundaries around God's truth with a certain degree of confidence, probability-wise. That's bold. We're taking God's truth and we're saying it's contained between man's measurements, plus and minus a certain percentage would be a probability. Okay, so this gives you kind of, I'm trying to show you the bigger picture. The reason we're doing a histogram or a sample distribution is to get an idea what the true population distribution is. Very important question. This is our sample. This will be a sample, what we call a sample proportion. Sample, sample proportion. Everything over here starts with the word sample. Everything over here starts with the word population. We haven't figured that pattern out. Okay. The group of stuff is called a descriptive statistic or, or sample statistic, right? So that's it. Now, we had, I threw in a way of actually calculating average if you're given a frequency and not actual raw data. That's equation number two and number five on that one page. Okay, are there any questions on that? Any questions on um, how that homework is dealt with if you want to do it online um, with the help? Okay. No questions? And let's go back to the book. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, so now I wanted to show you how that this thing here will will turn into uh, well, well, we're just heading, you're heading from a frequency graph to the histogram. First you do the, hist the frequency graph. See how many count in there. And it says, uh, so we have a lower class limit and upper class limit. So the largest number can belong to any one of these differences. And so and then we have the class boundaries. That's going to be the thickest. Now, notice you have a 0.5. Sometimes it'll extend by 0.5.
so that if you get 124, you know it's going to fall in this cell and not this cell. So there's no question of ties. It's going to fall into one cell or the other. You understand? That's why you have these these sort of 174, two, 124 to 174.5, and and then those are the class boundaries. Now you're going to get your midpoints, which is just the midpoint of that particular cell, right? And then here's your class width. But this stuff that you know, it's just it's just mechanical, so you can do it on your own. It's not a big deal. But I'm showing you how they got these little gaps in here. So, um, so they're still going up like 75 to 124. So you know you got your uh, like 49 units. So list the class limits. So you see what they put in the middle? 124.5, 174. So they're like little gaps that let you force you to put the data in one cell or the other. And then um, find the first and last values by projecting the same pattern. Let's go down. Uh, so this is more, okay, so you're gonna take your lowest, your highest data, subtract the lowest data value, and divide by how many cells you want total. That'll give you how wide it is, right? Is that right? Okay, so, uh, Round up, get convenient, it's usually best to round up, but da da da. But anyway, you can read all that. And then, um, okay. All right. Um, so here's an example. They have um, table 2.1. Um, so the biggest one was 308, the smallest one was 83. They want five cells, they're going to have to be 45. They round that to 50. Um, the minimum number is 83. Um, oh, okay. Now, this is another kind of data. It's called categorical data. Um, if you got frequency, it's already categorized, right? Uh, so this was emergency room visits, injury from sports and recreation. And uh, let's see if it has a better example. Okay, so these are the injuries, I guess, uh, ER. This is bicycling, 26,000, football, 25, uh, playground, basketball, all-terrain vehicles. Um, This would be good for setting up, say, like uh, insurance table to see what kind of premiums you would charge these different for these different sports, right? It looks like bicycling is number one. I notice when I travel down the highway, there's a lot of. Have you seen these ghost bikes? They're painted white, and then they're parked and chained somewhere. Have you seen those? They're all over the state. They're called ghost bikes, and they're all people have been killed on the highway. <laughs> Not that it's funny, but I mean, you just to get to get run over, and then they put their bike there, and it's painted white, and it's it's locked on there. I'm sure on the internet you'd have ghost bikes everywhere. There's probably a map to everyone in California. There's a lot, a lot of people. You know, you see them riding on the side of the highway. I'm thinking they're retarded. Like you're going to get killed. The probability is going to you're going to get ran over. That one, you know how it's hard to see them anyway. You know how easy it is even to run over a motorcyclist. <laughs> you don't see them unless they have the light on and even then if you go down like LA traffic you ever see them whip between cars all you have to do is open a door one time and that's it <laughs> I don't know I don't get it well, I guess they like risk I don't know anyhow so um, here's the look look what happens now this is a relative frequency so we take each frequency class that's your tally and divide by the total frequency that's your sample size and then this is the percentage when you multiply it by 100. That just gives you the same number as a percentage. So let's go on down. So uh, this is McDonald's lunch service times. And this is the relative frequency. Notice that it's percentage now. How come? Because we took the tally and we divided by N, the sample size. 
These become probabilities, a 22% chance. Is this okay? Okay. Um, okay, so now we're changing from, from this, uh, we're going to a, from a distribution of frequency to a relative frequency, which is the lead into the histogram. Okay, the normal distribution, so that you get that name down, has a lot of names. But normal distribution is another word is called the bell curve. The other one is Gaussian. Gauss um, is the one who discovered this distribution. And it's used over and over and over, especially in, um, in the science and like the biological, um, biology sciences. Everything seems to be grouped up around the center um, in that particular way. But it doesn't have to be. I was telling you for people who ride horses, there's a certain probability you're going to get killed by getting kicked in the head by your horse. I just want to cheer you up, but that's the way it looks. So usually you're going to get killed early on. <laughs> I thought that would be happy news. Um, so you can ta take a look already and start to see that, you know, this kind of looking kind of normal because look at the, sh the way it's piling up. We call it normal. Okay, any questions so far? Uh, so there you have it. Let's go on. I want to get to, we've already done quite a bit of chapter three, uh, exploring what does the gap tell us. Anyway, that's all boring now. Uh, there's Dunkin' Donuts and um, lunch service times. It says your turn. Well, there you have it, frequency distribution. I want to get on to the, oh, that's oh, okay. Oh, it's at the end. Yeah. I figured it'd keep going. I don't know why it stopped there. That's because I went in. Remember, I went in for a question. I didn't actually, uh, oh. And, um, anyway, what I mean is that I, I went to the textbook through a problem instead of going to the actual textbook by itself. So you can go here and have your e-text. Kind of convenient. Okay. Okay. All right. 2.2. Now we're going to talk about the histogram, which is already pretty much done. We've just taken each frequency. All right. I'll show you quickly. Uh, here it says important uses of the histogram. I'm not sure if you can see it, but visually display the shape of the distribution. Really, it's what it's about. Okay. And so look at the connection. The histogram is basically a graph of the frequency distribution, for example. And, and then, okay, class frequencies are used for vertical scales. So look, here's two charts. One is a relative frequency, and the other one is an actual histogram. And you see this one here, it doesn't show very well color-wise. This one here, actually look at the shape. It's the same graph, <laughs> right? But if you look at your scale, this is just counting how many, like 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. That would be counting how many tallies fell in each cell. Yes? But here, we've just taken it and divided by the summation of all the frequencies, which is your sample size. So now these have changed to probabilities. But the same graph. Okay? That's the point I was trying to make about Chapter 2. You're really building towards this this histogram, which is really what I want you to call it is, is a sample distribution. Because the whole reason we want this is to get the idea of how the population is distributing, is being is stacking. How does a P have? Huh? Does it have any relation to a... Um, P? Yeah. Not yet. Uh, we're getting there. P hat is when we're going to set up, for example, I might ask um, as a hypothesis what is the average height of a male, a male American, right? Um, so that's an average, right? So I would expect to be looking for an average in God's side, right? But if I asked, um, like, what's the chances that you're going to have um, 
let's say I'm saying that I believe that out of 10 s sports players, you know, seven are going to get hurt, for example. Now I have a ratio. So notice I'm not asking the question about the ultimate average. I'm asking a question about a specific ratio. And that ratio is, is represented by the true p, but it's a p hat, which is simply, how would I do p hat? How would I get p hat? Well, if whatever your question is, let's say it's um, the crime rate. You have, you have your, su your subset, yes? And you see of those, how many were victims to crimes uh, out of your sample? Let's say three. So three divided by little n is your p hat, is your estimate of what the true rate of crime is, right? The reason I have p hat is because I'm not always just looking for average or sample dis deviation or even a distribution. Sometimes I want to talk about a proportion in my sample leading to the true proportion. It's real important because a lot of the questions you ask are proportional. <laughs> well, yes, but the, right, but the thing to think of it is like this. You know how we're using these estimators against this other side, right? That really is the course. It's a hypothesis of using these estimators to predict these that we don't know. And sometimes your question may not be about the average. It might be by some relative proportion, that is, some fractional amount, like 3 out of 10, 2 out of thing. If that now, now 2 out of 10 is not asking you what the mean of the population is. It's not asking about the average. It's not asking about the distribution. It's asking what are the chances that this event will happen with this frequency, with this, with this A over B, with this ratio. So at some point, you're going to have to say, you know, I have this data. So one, one, one gentleman asked me how to calculate the impact on helmets. It was called kinetic energy. When kinetic energy strikes your helmet, there's a lot of people getting hurt in football, even with minor hits at the practice. They're getting little concussions that are adding up. So big push, I think these helmets are going to get bigger and bigger and uh, trying to stop this because they get their own kind of Alzheimer's at the end. They get hit so many times in the head. Uh, even the smaller, what we thought before was not dangerous, is adding up. So they have a special kind of Alzheimer's that's uh, derived from the wounds that they're having. These bruising is in the brain. Um, anyhow, that would be a good question right there as a P hat. I said before, I expect out of 10 players, seven of them are going to end up with brain hit damage. Seven out of what? Out of how many I've taken in my sample? That's a fraction. That's this out of that. So now I'm asking, what is the true proportion out there in the sports world? And I'm going to make estimates of that. That's P. Okay, that's a good question. Um, okay, um, this right here is some different types of distribution that we're getting, right? So we're getting this data from our sample. We're seeing how it's piling up. You can see that this one definitely looks normal or, or bell curve-like, yes? And this one is a uniform distribution, right? What's an example of that? Let's say throw dice. If it's a fair dice, each face has a probability of one six coming up, yes? So that would be in a case of discrete, uniform, um, discrete and uniform distribution. Now, if you look at these things, we call these skewed. This one's skewed over to the left, you see? So we don't consider it a bell curve. And this one's skewed over to the right, left and right. Any questions there? Uh, we'll go on. There, there's where you put that kind of like um, overlay on there, the bell curve overlay. And there is a, a test for normality that will be done in StatCrunch or on your calculator. So you can plug it in. If it comes along a straight line like this, if the dots follow a straight line, then that's further evidence that it's, it's bell curve. That's an option that you have. And here, here's how you use them, right? Here's stat, this, stat crunch, which is what's on this one. So nowadays, I think most of the time this course is taught. It's not taught anymore with calculators. But, you know, if you'd like to learn a calculator, it's okay. I'm not taking it against you. You can also use, um, you know, uh, Excel. So here are the different um, 
informations if you want to try to solve it this way. And then you have it for the calculator right here. This is for TI-83 or 84, and probably somewhat similar to these stats. So you have to enter your data into the calculator, and then it should plot the kind of graph you, you want. Uh, okay. Um, and then there's Excel. This is at the end of the chapter. Okay, let's go on. And now there's the relative frequency. Um, that's the checks of normality. Okay, so if you remember, you can pick how many cells. Remember I was telling you, you pick the largest observation and you subtract the smallest and you divide it by how many how many cells you want? Do you recall that? Well, if you pick it too finely, you're going to have a lot of gaps. So you can create a, a misleading graph. You can have stuff that has no tally in it, right? So here, here is a, a point here where they're just called a dot plot. But it's the same as a frequency tally, isn't it? They just stack the tallies up vertically. So it's already giving you a shape. You call it a dot product. Then we have stem plot. Um, here's where you take the first number, see? And then these are the, the last numbers. You put them, and they call it a stem and plot. And time series, it's just you have one of your graphs measures time, one of your axes. So, let's see. Okay. So this is a time series. They use that a lot for the stock market to try to predict it and find some inherent structure. Usually it's called insider information. Mm. These are just different types of graph. Yeah, this is all night. Um, this is what we call a polygon because you connected the midpoints of every rectangle. Um, the graphs that enlighten and deceive. So uh, let's see if I can show you one. Well, you can see how that just the size of the thing can mess you up, like uh, concluding thoughts. Okay, so that's that. Um, I'll leave you at that now. We're going to go over to Chapter 3. And I think it's what is that. Okay, so these are, uh, I'll just cover this quickly. It's called a scatter plot. So there's a something called a correlation coefficient that I'll go through later. But basically, it's asking how tight these observations are and if they're going in a slope that's positive or negative. So if you fit a line, best line you could fit into here. And, and there is a way to do it with calculus to find the best fit. Then that line, slope, the slope of the line will be used as a hypothesis to see if it's substantially different than zero. But this, you can see, is pretty tightly clustered. So I'd expect the coefficient to be relatively high, close to 1 and positive because the slope's positive. Do you see if a line went through? Here, a line can go in almost any way. <laughs> it, uh, it doesn't really have a slope to it so much as it's spread out. So we'd expect a very low correlation coefficient. This, um, you know, it's, it's good to know. And it can get kind of complicated, but not, not in this course. Uh, so this is cluster analysis. They use that a lot in, in determining who gets credit and who doesn't, or gets approved for credit. There's the coefficient r. r is the correlation coefficient that I was talking to you about. So um, you can see here that we have a correlation coefficient. I don't know. Can you see this 0.591? It's in the red box. Can you see it, or is it too small? No, it's so big. There, it's called little r correlation coefficient. And uh, by the way, even within the book, if you want to know a little more in depth, you can go in here. And that's right embedded within the book. If you don't quite get it and you'd like to hear somebody talk about it. Oh. So this is just telling you how to, this is a IQ score in brain volume. And the critical values are, okay, so that's called a correlation coefficient. You'll see it come up, but you know what it is. It's, you don't have to calculate it because the calculation is, is pretty tedious by hand. If you look at, um, on the second page, it says chapter 10, 
you have an equation for correlation R. Uh, so I won't have you do that, but hopefully your calculator can can do it. Okay. Okay, now we have P values. Uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, I don't like where they start talking about it. Uh, don't worry about regression. That's making the line fit in. You see how that line fit in? Into all of those? That's the best fit. That's a regression. But I don't want you to worry about that right now. This is uh, brain volume. Okay, so. Okay, there, there's what we've gone over now. Let's go over this. Um, this is describing and comparing. So we're going to be calculating our, our sample statistics. Okay, there's Verizon, AT&T. Okay, this, these are measurements. Measurements of center. When you have, uh, in physics, you have a center of mass. It's very, it's just like this, the measure of center. Um, what says, uh, why does it go back? Huh. Okay, so here's the properties of mean. The sample mean draws from the sample population Right, that's your subset. Um, the disadvantage of the mean is just one extreme value, an outlier. So if you're taking a bank average of the bank average deposits, but one dude deposited, you know, half a billion dollars, it's going to affect the average big time. And it's going to distort what's really going on in, the, in their business because we have an outlier. Okay. Uh, so there's what I finally explained to you about the calculation of the average. The top part means add up all of the data, and the bottom one is the sample size. True? So these are, they didn't notice they didn't put the little counters. I went full out and showed you I equals 1 to, to N. That's, otherwise, that sigma, I don't think, is understood if you don't know how it works. So another m name for average is mean, okay? So here's as simple as it gets. Those are the data points, one, two, three, four, five. So the sample size is five, correct? Add up all your observations, divide by n. So that's your mean, your average. We've done that. Now we have something called a median. Now, when you talk about property values in the prices of homes in California, they're not going to tell you an average because you can have some homes that are ridiculously expensive and ridiculously cheap. I've sold homes, and um, the cheapest house I sold for probably was about $5,000, uh, house and land, but the most expensive can go, there's no limit. So uh, the median, so let's take the calculation of the median and why, why are home values done in terms of a median instead of the mean? The mean, is the average, and like I said, really poor or really expensive homes can upset the scale of things. So then what you do is you have to set the stuff from smallest to largest and then do a march to the center. And I'll show you. Um, so first you sort it out, you see? Notice how they went from smallest to largest. Okay, so what you do with a median uh, is that once you set it up, like from smallest to largest, just track to the middle. This is your media. Okay? It's the middle guy. After you've, after you've let it. So you can see, it doesn't matter how big or small the extremes are. It doesn't affect at the center. Does anybody know what the, um, the average price of a home is now? Yeah, I think it's, um, let's see, in California. I think it's about 530000 
How you afford a house like that, I have no idea. Right now, roughly, it's costing a payment would be roughly $700 for every 100000 you borrow. So a half a million, you know, you're, you're close to $5,000 a month payments. You have to make a pretty good salary, right? Because 60000 of a year is going for just rent, not even um, utilities. So you must be meant to make like $200,000 and it's okay, <laughs> right? $200,000 salary between two people maybe they can afford a half a million dollar house. But that house is a shitty little house. <laughs> it's not even a nice house. It's like a really nice house is in the millions easy. I don't know. It's all crazy. Okay. Oh, I don't need that. All right. I need to get, that's what I got this expensive thing. Okay. So. Uh, let's see. Um, so if you have an even number, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Notice here we had five, so it was really easy to find the middle. This time you have to find the middle. Like now there are six, right? So. I'm going to go like this, right, and I'm going to stop here. So I've got one, two, three, three and a half, and here I go, one, two, three and a half. So the median's right here. So I'll take the average of these two, and the median's in between the average. That would be your new median for the whole thing. This is because it's an even number. Odds are nice because it ends right in the middle. All right? See, I had a row sheet going around it. Everybody sign that. Have you? See, I started uh, to her. Did you sign it? And you handed it to who? Oh, so you skipped him? Okay. Okay. Go ahead and sign it. Who has it? Oh, you got over to you. Okay. Okay, then we have another measurement called mode. Mode is simply going to be the data that has the highest frequency of, you know, that's, that's repeating. So uh, you see here the mode would be 0.3. Do you see there's more 0.3s? He didn't sign. You understand the mode? So mode is simply the one that's repeated the most. It's just definition. Um. Okay, I guess that's mid range. There's a way of ro rounding off that you might want to check this out because your answers might not be coming out exactly like in the computer because of the way they want you to round up or down. So if you've got a mean of 2, 3, and 5, that's going to be 3.33, which is rounded to 3.3, .3, which has one number decibel place than the original one. Okay. Yeah, well, those are your different centers of measurement of centers. What do you think's next? Um, this is all measurement of center. Ah, here we go. I was telling you about, remember your sample, X bar? You add up all your observations, but here you don't have the observations. You have frequencies in each cell. See it? F. So the sum of all your Fs, which is your sample size, adds up to 50. So this means take every tally in every cell and multiply it times the midpoint. Okay, it's all easy stuff. It's just a matter of doing it. This is called a weighted mean. Don't worry about it, but this W here will, will s like, if you want to give some homeworks more weight than others in terms of the grade, you can adjust the weight in front of the X. Um, grade point average for you that go in, that's, you know, in the university in here, A, 4, 3, 2, and 1. So you want to graduate, they'll be calculated this way. Uh, 
Um, and as usual, it gives you how to use these things. It's really nice. Uh, you can see you're going to have plenty of data to play with. Um, this is just homework. Okay. Remember we had measure of center? Guess what measure of variation means? The one was average, right? Measure of center, yes? What do you think this one is? Measure of what? What does variation mean? Huh? Well, what, what's the other thing other than average? What were we calculating? What was the next thing? Huh? Deviation. That's exactly what variation is. It's deviation. Does it make sense? Because of the first part, we're calling ways of calculating measurements of center. This is measurements of variation. Well, we went over that too. Uh, basic concepts. Uh, this just showing that how this is spread away has a higher variance than this guy because it's tighter around the average. See, your center of mass, if you cut this out like a piece of cardboard, and you put your finger under there where the center is, that would be actually where it balance. And so it has applications in physics that way. But anyway, uh, these are times weighted. And then uh, what's the range? The range is simply the biggest data minus the smallest. That's the range of your data. Uh, OK. Standard deviation of the sample. So what I've been pounding her over the head with. Look, we're going to divide by n minus 1, right? Sample standard deviation. Oh, can you believe that? Population standard deviation. Wow, two words. Two different symbols. That's not a lot to memorize. Okay. They take a lot of pages to go through it. And there. We have exactly what it is. You take every observation. Notice they don't have the i equals 1 to tell you where the counter starts, so it doesn't make sense to me. But anyhow. That is the equation we went through. And this is a shortcut. You can get from here, I can show algebraically that this is the same as this. Why might this be faster? Well, if you look at here, I don't have any average here. <laughs> Do I? You don't see an X bar here, huh? So I'm not actually, you know, this is a way around that. So sorry for my, okay. Yeah. So, this, you know, obviously it tells you how much it's deviating from the center. The larger the S, the greater the variation. <coughs> you can't have a negative dis de deviation. We don't know what that means. And then we have what we call a bias estimator. We want unbiased as possible. And it turns out that using S divided by N minus 1 is an unbiased estimator for this guy, sigma. You, you getting the idea? So now it's just a matter of calculating, which we've done. As I went ahead on that area. And here's just a simple example. Sum them all up, divide by n. Now we're going to subtract the mean from every individual thing, and then we're going to square the deviation. The reason it's squared, because we don't want negative numbers. So let me show you this. Um, OK, here's an example of how to work it out. And here's, if you want a movie about it, you click that one. So uh, basically what you want to do is set up a table so you can solve these. Also, Where do I start? Do you have to take row for the lab? Yeah, I take row for the lab. Yeah. 